So there are these cargo cults, and what these cargo cults are is they're just people. These Pacific Islander peoples is typically what it's referred to. And during World War II, U.S. would build military bases there. Maybe this also occurred with Japanese military bases, I don't know. But they would build airstrips, and airplanes would come down, and they would deliver the cargo. And of course, then eventually the Americans left. And many years later, it was discovered that these island peoples developed religions around these airplanes and all sorts of beliefs around these airplanes and made little straw and wood mock-ups of airplanes. Of course, there's no engine inside or anything like that. They, They didn't know anything about the internal workings of the airplanes, but they built sort of, you know, facsimiles of the runway and facsimiles of the airplanes. And sometimes they would even have ceremonies where they would, you know, run the airplane down the runway. And there were two lines of thinking. There, there are two sort of thoughts I had that sort of stemmed from, from these Pacific Island cargo cults. The first thought is to what extent are religions that we have, this is sort of the, the more trivial thought, to what extent are the are modern day religions just cargo cults of, of extraterrestrial? I mean, and th- now at first glance you say that, and, and, you know, that's like, you know, getting into crazy, kooky uh, crank town, but what's so what what's so crazy about space travel? There's not nothing really crazy about space travel. There's nothing really crazy about other beings from other planets. So maybe none like there's no element that's really crazy. And why wouldn't some beings from other planets come visit Earth in the same way that humans will visit other parts of the planet? You know. We'll go take a trip to Africa, and maybe these these space travelers are kind of like kind of like some some rich 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 merkins going on safari. And perhaps in the past, a bunch of uh, a bunch of people or entities from another planet visited Earth at some time, came into contact with some locals, and the locals saw these amazing things and and developed a whole bunch of cargo cult beliefs around these these things. I know there's some people who are saying that Ezekiel came into contact with what was a kind of spaceship. And he tried to describe it using terms of the world today because he was trying to describe it in a way that people of his time would understand. So he was using a lot of the time he, uh, uh, that people of his day would understand. But also, he probably had some difficulty understanding what this thing actually was. So there's a mixture of him not understanding what what a spaceship actually was and his translation of what the space was to, to, to other people. You know, and in the in the Indian religions they talk about the Vaimanas or whatever, the flying the flying cities. And they talk about the bigger city that's further up in the sky and then further down, you know, these little little saucer things come come to come to Earth. So that was just one idea I had. Like to what extent are religions just cargo cults? Now, I wouldn't say that in fact I think it's probably not very likely that the bulk of religion or spiritual thinking is really just a cargo cult from some long lost interaction with with extraterrestrials or whatever. People have dreams, for example, and and if it's not known what the mind is or it's not known to you that there is this thing called the subconscious, right? The subconscious is something that has to be has to be taught to people, right? If, if you don't believe that there's, or you don't know of such a thing as a subconscious, or you don't know that your mind isn't directly processing the world out there, but that what you're seeing in the world is actually just a projection from parts of your brain, that you're not seeing the world as it is, you're, you're seeing a, a, a filtered thing of the world, an interpretation of the world, then any kind of, but, but if you don't know that, then what you're going to imagine is that any kind of hallucination or any kind of dream, you know, is something that's actually there. You know, why would you not think? And that seems to be the most straightforward belief to have, given that 99% of the time, what you see is is what's actually there. So if you quote unquote, as, as in modern parlance, if you quote unquote, see something that's not actually there, well, back then, what reason would they have to believe that what they saw out of the corner of their eye wasn't actually there? They had no reason to believe. It makes perfect sense for them to just sort of assume that, that the little hallucinations and little things they see out of the corner of their eye, maybe just for a split second while they're sort of dazing off, that those things are actually there. Or when they dream and they see things in, in their dreams, you know, 
They may imagine that when you go to sleep, you are whisked away off to the spirit land. And they may some, say something like, the reason your memory or your memories of, of, your, of your travels to the spirit land are so, you know, the reason why dreams are so hard to remember is because you're off in, a, in another realm. And because of the nature of the realm, it's hard to really remember what you actually saw in that realm, the realm of the gods or what. So that's, but, but anyway, I'm, I'm going, going a far afield here. So that was my, my first thought about the cargo cults, is to what extent are, are religions and, and, and gods that people in the past worshipped, how much of those were basically just extraterrestrial sightseers who passed through Earth? And another thing I also wonder is, is to what extent some extraterrestrials are actually watching Earth kind of in the same way that humans will watch like a like a pack of of lion or the same way that humans will watch other animals and other animals very rarely because you know, other animals they're not very smart if you put a hidden camera the animals they'll never find the hidden camera or even if they do they'll just sort of poke at it and then move somewhere else they'll never you know it's, it's very easy to discreetly observe animals without those animals knowing that that's what you're doing and in fact you can observe them in fact, they can even see you observing them, and they'll see you, and they might get spooked a little bit, but then you go away, and you know they they'll assume that you're not observing them later, even though even though they they, they saw you at one point, but if they can't see you, they'll just assume oh you're not observing them, right? So so it's very easy to observe animals discreetly, and even when you get caught, it's not like you know they're going to radically alter their behavior or be under radical suspicion that you're constantly observing them or something. But with humans, of course, humans are a little bit more sophisticated than that. So to observe humans discreetly, you're going to have to have a lot better technology and a lot better. You're going to have to be a lot better at hiding your observation devices. So that's just sort of how like I would analogize what I think is going on. Right? I, I sort of like this is just sort of a, a suspicion I have is that like basically extraterrestrial beings are watching humans, not like, you know, intently but but they're sort of just w with like kind of a passing interest in the same way that humans will watch the behavior of other animals with sort of a passing interest. And humans will watch animals discreetly just to sort of see what those animals are like. I mean, it's not something, you know, th they're not really attached to us or anything. They're just sort of, you know, oh, look, here's what the humans are doing. But and so that's sort of sort of the, the, the trivial stuff I was thinking about when I was watching another documentary that mentioned the cargo cults. But the more the more important thing, I think, is, is to recognize that everything you think of is kind of a cargo cult. That every every thought you have is gonna is incomplete to a certain degree. Like we talk about a cargo cult and we talk about, say, they build this facsimile of a plane. And it's just a facsimile. It's just this very sort of superficial recreation of that thing. Or they create a runway. And it's just a very superficial recreation of the runway. And, you know, we, having knowledge of, of or having a greater degree of knowledge of how that stuff works, we know that there's a lot more that goes into getting a plane coming down, landing on it with a whole bunch of cargo than just having like a bed of asphalt and a bunch of lights. Right. And, and a control tower like you have to have a whole lot more stuff than just those sorts of superficial things. But here I think would be like another example of of a cargo cult, something very simple. When you're thirsty, you drink water. When you drink water, you stop being thirsty. Now, some people know more about the mechanisms, you know, about about the about how cells require water or you can talk about uh, breathing. But really, like humans and for most of their history just breathe without knowing what exactly is is needed now humans today will say oh i know why you breathe i have i have a further down you know i i, I have a i have a more detailed understanding of why you have to breathe right you need oxygen okay oxygen what's that it's it's the o okay but what what exactly does the oxygen molecule look like i don't know i mean look i can look i can look it up and i can find all this stuff but i don't know off the top of my head and I don't know off the top of my head exactly I, I also know some other terms you know oxygen is required for certain metabolic processes in cells but then like what does that actually mean I can't really tell you so so the idea that what so once you get below a certain level on anything it becomes a cargo cult it becomes oh you need oxygen to survive but then below that it's just 
empty, right? Kind of like when when the natives uh, build that sort of uh, straw and wood facsimile of the airplane. Once you get inside of the airplane, I mean, forgiving that it's not made of metal, I mean, that's but that's something that's impossible. Um, but once you open the door on the little airplane facsimile, there's going to be nothing inside. Or maybe, at most, one of them caught a peek of what's inside the airplane and saw a whole bunch of buttons and, and stuff. And it, it sort of just, and, and so from what they could remember, you know, unless they have a photographic memory, with, which very few people do, from what they can remember, you know, it just looks like some sort of mishmash of, I don't know, circles and jutting out bumps and stuff. But all human, but all human thought is a kind of cargo cult. All thinking is a kind of cargo cult, and that it is incomplete, and that it doesn't get down to "quote unquote" the fundamentals of how any of this works. You know, even an electrician, you know, may not necessarily know exactly how electricity works. He doesn't have to. All he has to do is do stuff that functions. All he has to do is know how it how it works at at, at a practical level. And so I was thinking about like this uh, cargo cult thinking, which got me thinking about uh, um, peer review, or at least or the journal system called peer review, peer reviewed literature. And that looks very much to me, you know, people who have a lot of faith in peer in, in the journals, you know, uh, they're not actually scientists. And that's something that's something I've noticed is that there's a gap between how much actual researchers value peer review and how much normies value peer review or the journal system. And of course, even the term peer review is misleading because all, all papers are peer reviewed. It's just a matter of do they get accepted by some particular journal. But I think this uh, cargo cult, or, or I guess we call it a, a, a secular cargo cult, I think it goes well beyond the journal system. Because when you think about the university itself, I think what we have with the with the university is is a confusion regarding the form, or uh, overrating the importance of form. Because what you have at universities is, it, is you tend to have like a lot of smart people, because that's just where the smart people. And the origins of universities are actually very, are actually a lot older than a lot of people think. Is that um, they started off as well let me put it like this at one point they were called uh all sorts of things they were called cathedral schools they were called monastery schools and it wasn't until later that the first cathedral school came to be known as a university and so at the very beginning they were just schools for clergy because a church needed needed clergy and not only clergy that could read and write latin or at least just read it read enough latin for to read the Bible and and express the good word to to the to the local yokels, but also uh, to serve as somebody who could act as a as a mediator, act as an arbitrator, and somebody who understood land and land divisions, somebody who could know a little bit of math, somebody who could know a little bit of astronomy. So they had and so they had a few things that you needed to know in order to be in order to be a priest. And so people would go to these cathedral schools or monastery schools and at first it wasn't it wasn't so formalized like they would have courses you know in pubs or sometimes the courses would be outdoors that usually they would be around the cathedral or monastery because that's where you know the people teaching worked you know that's that's where all like the the high priests lived and worked and so when they were gonna gonna teach the other priests you know, you would go sort of to that area, right? but eventually, uh, it became standardized that you would that you would go to a, a, a specifically set aside area for the monastery itself. Like they would have a permanent building near the monastery to teach other priests, and eventually, this these places would be specifically built for that purpose. And it wasn't until God, I, don't, I forget the year. I think it was like eleven, somewhere between eleven hundred and twelve hundred. I want to say maybe earlier than that was the University of uh, the University of Paris, or the Cathedral School of, of Paris became the University of Paris. Uh, they changed the name to the, uh, or, or they basically created like like originally it was just uh, people at the at the cathedral at the monastery would teach, you know, 
uh, a, a, a bunch of people how to become how to become priests and teach them a bunch of other stuff. But they changed their name to the University of the Students and Masters of Paris. And so you saw a shift away from the teaching being done merely as a function of the monastery or a function of the cathedral to being a thing in itself, like to, to the quote-unquote university being the thing, as opposed to it just being courses offered at the monastery. But eventually what happened is you had a bunch of people who didn't want to become clergymen. They wanted to do other things. They wanted to become doctors and they wanted to become lawyers, you know, and and later uh, they, there was offered, a, you, you could get a degree in some places in philosophy. And philosophy, of course, included mathematics, the natural natural philosophy. There was, they, they didn't know a whole lot of stuff back then, so they could basically teach you, you know, everything and call it philosophy. But right there, uh, that looks like something kind of either like a cargo cult or perhaps well here see that sort of transition where you have these cathedral schools come universities and then they start teaching law and they start teaching philosophy why would you have and start teaching medicine why would you have that at the same places where they teach theology what's the point of this and so you had this compression or you had this situation where learning medicine which is a you know an objective thing now at the time obviously you know we some questionable methods but learning medicine was an objective thing and learning law was an objective thing within obviously within the context of of law that is defined by by, by humans so you, so that doesn't seem like something you would do just if you sat down and decided to do it but it looks like you had two things going on one, uh, you already had sort of the the resources, and you had, I, I guess, sort of the the tradition that is, you know, this is where you go if you want to go to school, and so they had, uh, perhaps, you know, had places where where students could sleep. They had places where students could, could lodge while they learned all the things. So I guess you had sort of an institutional and and structural. And by structural, I mean like buildings um, available um, for for students who are uh, who are going to the cathedral schools to become clerics, to become clergy. Those then could could be used for people going to schools to become doctors and lawyers. And so when I look at the university, I look at it seems to be a, a cargo cult, but it seems to be a cargo cult of something like let me put it like this: if you were to try to figure out how you would create engineers or how you would create doctors. Like, like let's say you have a company that needs mechanics. You have a company that needs doctors or some government agency need doctors. Normally what you would do is you may establish a school teaching people medicine, right? Oh, you want to become a doctor? You know, we can only teach so many people. We'll give you like an intelligence test or whatever. We'll look at, you know, we'll look at some some, some stuff you've done before. And then, you know, you, you'll we'll do classes to make you a doctor, teach you all the things you need to be a doctor. And there'll be all sorts of uh, research on what it is they need to know. Uh, over time, you would refine sort of the teaching methods. Okay. But that's not how it actually happened. That's not how this actually came to be. You got these medical schools attached to these universities that also teach theology. Okay? But of course, eventually that became less important as, as the United States became more and more secular. But it's attached to departments that teach history. Okay? Now, what is history? You know, what is the difference between history and people? But that's another story for another time. Um, this sort of idea that people view history as a field separate and distinct from you know, current events and politics. Now, it is a little bit separate because it's not current events. And it's past current events. Anyway, so so the, the the structure of university is not something optimized. It's not something de designed. They didn't do or nobody ever did any A B testing to to figure out what is the best way to to teach all these things. It's just something that that started out. You know, its origins, its its basic structure can literally be traced back to 700 medieval Europe. 700 AD medieval Europe. Now, of course, it's sort of morphed and, and, and changed a little bit over that time, but it's still the same basic structure. So this is something that should be immediately questionable. And another problem you have is that 
that you have multiple levels going on here. Uh, because on one level, um, if you're an employer or if you're a normie, what you do is you use sort of the the credential status to determine whether or not what someone else is saying is true. You sort of use, use the credential as a quick heuristic for somebody who doesn't know anything to try to decide whether or not a thing being said is true or not. That's what you do. That's what you do there. But in order to have a credential, you have to have you have to go to one of these these universities. And what what this does is it is it gives the universities a a sort of invisible apple, right? So like if you're smart, you want other people to know that you're smart. And so where are you going to go? You're going to go to the universities to go through all the courses and do all this stuff. So even though it's not in any way, any kind of an optimized way of learning these things, because, but even though it's not not an optimized way to learn any of these things, smart people are going to go there, and you can use a credential from a university as a heuristic for whether or not somebody knows about something, simply because that's what other people are are doing. That's, for example, that's what an employer does. That's what a government government uh, agency does. They want a, a accredited scientists in X, Y, and Z, even though the university is probably a very shitty format. For example, you know, two years of core curriculum, and then you have all sorts of undergrad requirements, and you have to. And the way the courses are set up, you know, it's not. Like, like not, none of this is standardized or optimized or, or, or scientifically tested, right? They're, they're teaching classes the same way they were teaching, you know, at least in 1900, probably well before that. So it's not, it's not a scientific thing. It's not, it's not a, you know, an optimized, you know, production line for, for creating knowledgeable people. It's funny, you know, people will, will always say, oh, we know that, that, cr that creating knowledgeable people is way more important than creating cars, but, but, but so much more optimization and so much more A-B testing is done for a car production assembly line than for the production of, of smart people. And so what ends up happening is even though this university, it's a very shitty way to, to train people, um, it ends up being an okay heuristic of knowledge about something simply because that's where all the smart people are going to go. But then, then we get another problem. Now, luckily, this is something that that is starting to change a little bit. But you've you know you've sort of had a gap between you know the hard science and the social science, and this this gap has gone back to to the to the very beginning. I mean, this goes back to the the division between theology and philosophy, cathedral schools. So this is not anything anything new. But something to keep in mind about these universities is how dangerous they are and why I think history and political science probably should not be at these places. Not that people won't be interested in those things, but they shouldn't be taught at these places. And the reason being, the reason being is that we need to think about what these universities are. First off, they're not any kind of optimized way to, to do research, figure out what research is to be done, or to train experts. It, it is a highly... It's highly suboptimal, right? So, so we shouldn't be really attached to these things in that regard. But one thing we should understand is that the structure of a university is very similar to that of, like, it, it, it's it's connect. I don't I don't know how to say this without sounding a little bit kitsch, but it's like a church. Like you have people like. It's it's almost as if it's designed to indoctrinate people. And one thing to and and keep in mind that back when you know th these were the cathedral schools, that's literally what it was. It they, they, it was to teach people the doctrine of the church along with a bunch of other stuff. And another thing to 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 sort of look at this is even though it wasn't even though Christianity, for example, wasn't designed to to be how it is. Um, there's just a natural evolutionary process of institutions and religions. And institutions and religions that are able to sustain themselves, uh, continue. those are the ones that persist. Those that are not able to sustain themselves do not persist. And so when you're looking at the church, at, at a university, you're looking at an extension of, of the church. Now, today it doesn't have those uh, Christian origins anymore. Okay, I mean, Harvard, for example, still has... 
a, a, a theology department and you could still get a degree in theology but it's kind of a it's kind of a throwback and kind of a kind of a joke at this point but you know what, what how are these places set up well the first thing that happens is in order to get into one of these places you have to have x y or z standards right you have to, you have to meet certain standards in order to get in Okay, so there's a selection cutoff. And then once you get in, you have to pay a bunch of money for the privilege of getting in. Now, imagine if I got a bunch of people to come to a room to listen to what I had to say. Not only to listen to what I had to say, but listen to what I had to say like, you know, an hour a day or maybe more than that, maybe like an hour and a half a day or two hours a day, three days a week, gave them a bunch of assigned reading. They had to do that reading, and they had to demonstrate mastery of the material. And 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 and, and then I would grade their papers, and then at the end, of, and I would they would grade that I would grade their papers. And on top of all this, they had to pay for this privilege. They had to pay for this privilege of me doing all that. Now that's what you are doing with a quote unquote history professor. And at first glance, unless you think that this history professor knows a whole bu- bunch of shit. That he's a real special, uh, special guy, and that, or, or that, what he is teaching. Maybe he's not particularly special, but all the stuff that he's teaching is 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 deep and woolly truth. You know, at at first glance, if it's just any other guy, this looks kind of like a culty arrangement. You know, you got people coming in willing to spend twenty thousand dollars a year. I don't know how much do you have to spend to go up the levels in Scientology. You know, Scientology gets a bunch of gets a bunch of crap. For how much it costs to go through all the, uh, you know, the operating thetan levels and stuff like that, uh, but how much do you have to pay to, to get a get a, you know, BA and then a then an MA and then a PhD and how long does that take and how much do you actually learn going up those levels? I mean, at first glance, they'll tell you, oh, these are all really really important stuff. This is all stuff you really need to know, right? But of course, every every cult is going to say that. So it may sound kind of kitsch, it may sound kind of cliche, you know, what I'm saying here, but like the, the structure is that, I mean, I mean, look, the structure grows out of churches. It grows out of monasteries and cathedral schools, okay? So in these monastery and cathedral schools, these are institutions that evolve and, and, and persisted. They weren't designed from on high or whatever, well, I guess... In a sense, they were sort of designed, but there wasn't some sort of grand master plan to brainwash everybody. And, and but but the thing is, that's what that's what wins, right? Even if it wasn't designed to serve as like a a a vehicle for impressing doctrine onto people, doctrine which then reinforces the institution. Even if that's not how it was designed, that's it, it, like any institution that does that is going to be the ones that that went out okay so even if you have a whole bunch of institutions each engaging in a whole bunch of random strategies right the ones that impress a doctrine onto its adherents or onto its members a doctrine which then reinforces the institution okay those are the one those are the institutions that are going to persist and you go to university what do they tell you to, to do they tell you to look at the credentials they tell you to look at quote unquote peer review which is just the journal system which is all controlled by by people up in high ranks you know it's, it's all controlled by like all the operating thetans right it's all controlled by you know the, the the high credential people who then control the journals and then we get into public discourse they say only listen to things that are controlled, only 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 look at research that is under the control of a you know X Y Z impact you know journal, a journal that is run by people with certain credentials in the cathedral schools or or in the universities. Okay, so what I'm saying is that this is a very dangerous structure. Okay, and and it's made more complicated by the fact that most people like it's made more complicated by the fact that that most people who are saying you know screw peer review are in fact cranks and and like most of the time when people criticize peer review they're cranks and they're and they don't like you know what what peer-reviewed research says because the peer-reviewed research says that what they say is crap that's normally the case and let me let me say something else if you went back to say 1000 a.d and you had some rando 
who uh, some rando you know merchant who on his who had enough money that he could perform little experiments on his spare time if he was saying something regarding physics that went up against you know what the uh, what the what the monastery school of Milan was saying regarding physics this you know eccentric uh, merchant with free time to conduct experiments on his own would probably be wrong and you could probably go back and say that you know this guy was would probably be wrong and that the and that the philosophers at at the uh, uh, cathedral school at Venice are probably correct okay so you you could you could say that back then as well but we then wouldn't go on to defend the institution okay but let me let me put it but let me give you a, another thing Let, let's let's look at something else let's say you had somebody who way back then you know, argued against the resurrection as a scientific impossible and had a bunch of arguments. Who knows, maybe he even traveled to the Holy Land and looked in a few places and said that there's no way the resurrection, that this is all just a scam, that Jesus was probably just a con man. You know, obviously there would be a lot of hell to pay for saying those things. And so you can see that there's a, a qualitative difference, you know, between one guy having sort of an alternative view of physics that goes up, goes up against, you know, what the what the philosophers at the Cathedral School of Venice think versus a guy questioning theological doctrine. Now, now, when I, you know, when, 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 for example, someone says, I don't think racial diversity is a good thing and that separation of the races, perhaps more than just the separation of the races, perhaps you want to, you know, say something more than that, maybe, or maybe you want to say, but not exactly the races, but maybe separation of, of people on, on other grounds, let, uh, you know, allow more, uh, you know, s something, s some, something other than, you know, the, the come, come one, come all diversity as, as sort of a, a, a sort of a holy duty is questioning that forget whether it's, it's, you know, you know, white nationalism or whatever, forget, you know, forget the what specifically the, the, the alternative being proposed would be, whether it be like some sort of you know, what, what I call IQ nationalism in the filter state or, 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 or racial separatism. F forget any of that. Or, for example, let's say you're questioning um, the narrative of, of segregation. Say, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, blacks actually had it that, that bad during segregation. In that sense, w what are you more analogous to, to, in, for, to the medieval Era. When you when you're questioning basic narratives of race, what are you doing? Are you questioning physics? Is that like the guy from the Middle Ages who was questioning, you know, physics, or is it more akin to the guy questioning theology? And it, and I think it's pretty clear what it's more like. And sort of as an aside, I guess this is kind of why I don't really like the term left and right because let's say, <laughs> I mean, let's say you had some some narrative coming out of uh, out of the in, in the middle ages and you had some people saying you know i don't exactly believe in this narrative no or, or for example let's say you had like the the catholic church in the, in the middle ages saying hey we're gonna you know let's let's mass import a whole bunch of muslims or whatever into europe this is in 1000 a.d and they said that there's some scriptural reason for this all right so they're scriptural literalists saying let's import a whole bunch of you know, people from the Holy Land. Maybe the book says these are holy people. These are better people than than you. That that Europeans are degraded people. That's what the strict scriptures say. And let's bring them in because they're better than you. And all all this all this stuff. Would we call that a left wing doctrine? You know, would, would we call that a left wing doctrine? I, I you know I don't really quite see it as a le yeah I I just don't see it that. Way. I mean you could, but but then of course that that calls into question what exactly is meant by left wing in this in this thought experiment. Because, like, look, like, I see sort of at a neurological level, I see the the, cra the craziness about racism, the whole racism narrative, right? I see that as as being, you know, like the chief religion. Um, like, f for example, you know, the Daily Stormer gets kicked off the internet and gets banished to the dark web. You know, the dark web, and of course the dark web is, uh, you know, a bunch of them are saying, hey, we don't want the Daily Stormer here. They'll allow, you know, snuff sites, sites where you kill people. They'll, they'll allow, like, assassination markets, you know. They'll allow child porn down in the dark web. They'll allow all sorts of horrible stuff in the dark web. But as soon as you say anything regarding race, then it's, then, then it's something different. Now... Andrew Anglin, you know, at most you could you could misconstrue 
the Daily Stormer into advocating, you know, mass murder, into advocating genocide. Now, that's not true, but just for the sake of argument, let's let's just imagine that, you know, that that's what these people think. They think that the Daily Stormer is advocating mass murder. That's what they think. Okay. Um, and, and so going with that, are they hypocritical for banning him, you know, because they think he advocates ma- mass murder? The answer is yes, because they allow sites of other people who, who support, you know, mass murder. Um, so it's not about actual harm in this sense. You know, this is another question. Why is, why is Hitler the pinnacle of evil, whereas Stalin is merely also evil? And the answer, of course, is the, the answer, of course, ha- doesn't have to do with the actual harm done. The answer has to do with the narrative, a, a, a racial narrative. And, of course, the racial narrative around Hitler is, is particularly devious because Hitler was not particularly white nationalist. He was not particularly, you know, he was not, he was not an advocate of some sort of white ethno state or some sort of pan-European, you know, identity or whatever. You know, and he wasn't, and, of course, you know, he was for, like, closed borders and, you know, let's not import the third world into Germany, but so was everyone else. So, like, the Nazi regime was not particularly white nationalist. And the great trick that was done was to link the Hitler regime to whiteness, to white racial, to, to thinking in terms of what's good for us whites. You know, the, that sort of thinking. Like, you know, blacks, they think, what's good for us? What's good for us blacks? What's good for us Amerindian, mestizo, Hispanic peoples? What are, that sort of mystery meat population. What's good for us, right? Thinking about that. That became, you know, tied with Hitler, right? and that was that was a, that was a great trick that was that was pulled. And what they ended up being able to do was was to turn quote unquote racism into a self-referential sin, right? It, it wasn't it wasn't merely that you know, and and that's sort of how it's become. Now, if you are to point this out, they'll go, well, no, actually, you know, there was a there was a great deal of of terrible sort of on case harm in a normal sense, but then, you know, then then you're getting into the weeds. They'll say, look at how poor Africa is, that's because of European colonization. That's that's retarded, right? But but they'll say that to sort of shift it to sort of shift it to you know real harm. And the reason that we're really hard up against quote unquote racism, which is just you know whites thinking minds. The reason we're so hard up against that is because of the harm is because of the on case harm but then they'll go back to saying oh we need to have hate speech laws hate crime laws well, wait a minute you know in europe they have the hate speech laws but in the u.s they have the hate crime laws but wait a minute so now you're talking about laws that punish people that, that add on an, an additional punishment not based on anything done but based on thoughts but based on quote-unquote hateful thoughts and another thing to consider is that um, this whole the, the the racism mania is something that came very recent, and it's something that hasn't really existed much in human history. So, and and of course, this is why you know when people talk about like th- when the people talk about, for example, that white nationalism is never coming back. What they're doing is they're saying, look at how pathologized white nationalism is, and then they think any any quote unquote a political movement uh, that is pathologized so heavily you know, never comes back. But of course, that's a, a, a stupid way to look at it because it's it's not, you know, it's not a political movement in a normal sense, okay? You know, you don't have, it's not something that has to be taught, right? It's something that has to be, let me put it this way, white nationalism is not something that has to be taught. It's something that has to be untaught. Every generation, every person has to be untaught, right? When they go to school, they have to be untaught "Quote unquote racist thought, right? They have to be untaught it. This is what people. It's it's amazing. You see all these articles lamenting racism in little kids and, and in babies, and of course because they don't have, because because they're so stupid because they believe everything's down to you know environment. You know they imagine oh they must be picking up these subconscious cues floating in the air to think racism, to to think to think in prejudicial ways at age five or something. It's like no, they just haven't been untaught." anything else. the un the unteaching the undoing comes later so you know, so that it's it's normal but and and, give, and given that it's normal so now what you have is you have an institution that is literally, literally an extension that is literally an extension of medieval churches that has that has created this racism thing as a sin unto itself divorced from harm over and above harm 
You know, you got racism qua racism as the sin over and above the harm it does, right? That's that's the point of hate crime. You know, you're not just punished for murder, you're punished for the sin on top of that. Or you're not just punished for assault, you're punished for the for the hate sin on top of that. Okay. So, you know, and of course, sin and hate, sin doesn't really, you know, carry the same weight that it used to have. You know, sinful that that was now things are sort of playfully referred to as sinful, but now it's 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 hate, or I think maybe hate is starting to lose its punch. Racism, of course, still has a lot of punch, right? And it serves the same sort of purpose. And you still have, and 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 it's, and you also have the connection of the unassailable authority. And and it's a real and it's a real pain in the ass to to deal with this unassailable authority. One people are saying, well, Ryan, why don't you uh, go get one of these degrees? <laughs> and it's like, okay, well. You know that's that's like well. First off, I do have a degree, but the, but I guess they're saying go get a PhD or something. Okay, well, first off, that's like freaking. You know, that's going to be another four years. That's going to be a whole bunch of cash. Um, I'm not going to actually learn anything meaningful. Like I know, I know. Maybe this is sort of a bigoted, but I, thing to say. But no, you don't. You, you, no, you'll you will learn things. You know, getting getting a history PhD, but the thing is, you'll forget most of it. You'll forget ninety percent of it within about five years, anyway. And what you learn, like it's it's just so so. I'm I'm not going to really learn a whole lot, and it's certainly not going to be worth all the cash and and all the work, right? But in addition, you know, it's going to be it's going to be something that's just going to be hand waved away. Like let's say I get a PhD in in, in history. Like first off, people are going to hand wave away that away by saying soft science. Um, but then, of course, if I say, but, but like, look what happened to Russian and Jensen and Richard Lynn when they got their credentials in their fields. Okay, they got their credentials in their fields, and then they say, okay, now that we have the credentials, now you'll listen to us when we say, you know, the racist things. Right? Because, like, all the, the learning they did, all the stuff that the Philippe Russian had to learn to get his PhD, for whatever reason, did not dissuade him, wasn't enough to dissuade him from, from his quote unquote racist views. Right. Apparently, all that all that that knowledge that he got, you know, to get that credential did not did not debunk race realism in his mind. Okay, so um, but anyway, but the, but the thing is, like, then these people do that; they get these credentials, okay, and then they say like the racism, um, the the quote unquote racist things. But then it's like, oh, well, now you're just a hack. Your credential doesn't mean anything now because you're a kook. You're a kook scientist. You're a kook psychologist. You're a kook biologist. Okay, you're a crank. You're 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 a racist, hateful crank biologist, geneticist, psychologist, whatever. Okay, that that's that's what that's what they did to these people. Okay, when you actually have the credential, and then you go out and say these things, you know, when you when you have these credentials and you challenge the whole race racism, you know, narrative that sort of emerged following World War II. And following the linkage of Hitler with white identity that came later, you know, when you have these things, uh, like, like it, it, it's like, what's what's the point of getting the credential then? Because I see what happens to people who get the credentials, and and say the heterodox things. They get they get blasted, and their and their credential just gets hand waved away. And also for me, like, in order to get a relevant credential, it it would be it would be eight years, right? Because because my history degree doesn't mean shit. To, well, no, it wouldn't be eight years. <laughs> God damn, I wouldn't, because I wouldn't have to do any of the core curriculum or whatever. Go back to Kansas State, but yeah, it'd probably it'd probably be about six years. <laughs> so like, it, so yeah, it would just be absolutely crazy for me to, to to get the credential. And and what and what and what's else? I'm in constant contact with a bunch of people who have these credentials. Um, I even know one person very well who's who's on track who's on track to getting his PhD. Okay, so you know I have access to credentialed advisement right even though i mean i mean of course it's it's no substitute for knowing it yourself but i do have access to credentialed advisement so yeah so me getting getting a degree is like not or me getting a phd in a in a relevant field is is totally is going to be totally is a totally ridiculous idea but the first thing to understand is the problem and the first thing you know cuz we have this this crazy this absolutely crazy racism movement and it's just getting crazier and crazier and crazier because it's not it's not founded on anything real because it's not founded on anything real 
you know, there's no way, for example, people talk about like the oppression of slavery and segregation, right? Well, that's not, that, that's not real. That, that's not a real thing. You know, the differences today are, are almost entirely product of genetics. So there's all sorts of reasons to, to, to know that. Okay, so none of that's real. And because it's not real, it can, it can go on forever, right? Because you have these racial gaps and they, and they never go away, okay? Or, or they'll only go away if you have literal quotas, like if you literally mandate, like, like like what you could do, like the government could employ everybody and pay pay everybody the same, and then the racial gaps would go away. All right, I mean you could do that, okay, and that's kind of what ha- is happening with with affirmative action quotas and and diversity sides. Okay, and um, affirmative action quotas not only in getting the credentials, but then in terms of employing people with the credentials, right, making it easier for blacks to get relevant credentials. Okay, so that's sort of so. You, so in that sense, we kind of have that happening where the government is literally paying people the same, or, or even if it's not the government, it's it's sort of a an alignment of of universities, government, and businesses in that direction. But even with all of that, right? It's it's like people know people people are aware of the racial differences, and they're aware that these racial differences are persisting even with the quotas. Okay, so and it's it's just not working. And, and, you know, and one thing you could do is you could, A, go back and question the basic doctrine, or B, you could level on greater and greater racisms. You know, you, you, you begin to come up with more and more exotic explanations. You, you come up with, with deep uh, networks, you know, you come up with really implicit sort of psychological things or it, it 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 just gets increasingly unfalsifiable like you you get the idea that oh the problem is brown people they think they're stupid and it's this internalized white supremacy that causes them to think that they're stupid which causes them to do poorly on on everything or you know you get you get something like oh well uh, what happens is why people have it easier to go to college because because their family went to college and all and all this stuff and it's all and it's just unfalsifiable. There's no way to test any. Right? It's just something that's said and sometimes it's, it's plausible. Sometimes it's really exotic and and not even not necessarily plausible. Okay, but of course that's what happens because there's no there's no limit. It's it's a blank check, right? Slavery and segregation and all the mythology surrounding that. It's a bit. It's a blank check. Right? There, there's no. There's there's no buddy any go, saying okay this is this is the effect of that this is this is how much the reparations no it's it, it's 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 like infinite reparations right and so reparations are being paid like forever and if you ever try to question the basic idea of it all you know you begin to question hey i don't think segregation actually did anything negative to blacks it may have actually been a net positive given that it gave them you know monopolies over their own markets which and that, that that's a little bit of a complicated economic but anyway if you question that well then you are now at odds with the cargo cult right this all goes back to that cargo cult thing you're now at odds with with the credential people you're now at odds with the experts and here's another thing the people who question this doctrine well they are now suspect you know why they're suspect because they question the doctrine right it's sort of like you know don't listen to this guy saying that God doesn't exist because he's an atheist. Like, well, no shit, <laughs> right? Or like, don't don't listen to this guy who says the whole racial narrative is crap and that all the differences are down to genetics. Don't listen to him. He's a he's a racial separatist. He's a white nationalist. It's like, well, like, no shit. Now, it's that the analogy isn't completely one to one because. Questioning the racial narrative does not necessarily lead to some sort of positive political position. Whereas, you know, saying God doesn't exist literally makes you an atheist. Saying that, okay, I think actually a better comparison would be more like, you know, this person isn't necessarily an atheist, but he questions the the the, the link between God and the Pope. He questions the direct link between God and the Pope and does not believe that the Pope is God's representative on earth. Right. So don't listen to all his criticisms of the Catholic Church because he is, you know, he is a, a, a an apostate and a heretic. Don't right, don't don't listen to his heresies because he is a heretic. Right. That's sort of what. And, and so when you have somebody's 
Like, and so when someone questions like the basic racial narrative, they'll say, don't listen to him questioning the racial narrative, right? Because he is a racist. But of course, racist is defined as someone who doesn't who doesn't believe in, in the narrative, right? So it's like, yeah, well, no shit. So basically, you have defined your terms in such a way, right, that that you're not going to listen to somebody who questions the narrative because if they question the narrative, they are ipso facto a bad person, right? And of course, this is not helped by the fact that people who still say the Earth is flat, or people who believe vaccines. Cause that, that there's a whole bunch of people of, of various dubious causes also sort of questioning the establishment. And so the establishment gets to look good in, in a few instances. And then they and then and then they and then when they turn around and say, hey, let's open up the borders. Let's bring in five million black people into the Netherlands. It'll be fine. You know, they say just crazy ass shit like that. That is all, you know, had results that were totally predicted by you know, the racists, right? The racists totally predict that all these groups were going to be a net fiscal drain on the countries. We're going to create no-go zones. We're going to we're gonna result in, like, local governments becoming little mi- mini caliphates throughout France, for example, you know? But the problem is, right, all these other instances where the experts get to sort of, I guess they, they get to sort of beat up on tin cans. Like, you get people saying... You know, saying, "Oh, I think that the that that aliens control the government or whatever." They, they get to beat up on all these little uh, conspiracy theories. You know, it, it it gives them a lot of authority. So when then when they get to the you know the real challenger, right? The the the, the fundamental the, the the movement that's fundamentally challenging their their racial narrative, right? Which is the center of it all, um, and and it is the center of it all. That's that's a that's probably a proposition I, that needs a little bit of defending, and and so and so this is sort of like the the Shermer strategy, like what Mickey Shermer does, you know, um, like when Mickey Shermer was arguing with Holocaust deniers, deniers, what he would do, like like for example, when you ask Mike Michael Shermer about Holocaust denial, he'll say, oh well, we at Skeptic Magazine, uh, Skeptic Magazine, we look into all sorts of things, we look into Bigfoot. Uh, urine therapy, Holocaust denial, alien abductions, the Loch Ness monster, remote viewing. So you see what he does there, right? You just sort of like right? that's and that's the track, right? You you sandwich it in there with a whole bunch of other other stuff, right? That's that's the tactic. That's 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 the point. And the point is to put sort of you know Holocaust revision on the same level as remote viewing, right? That's uh, and it's it's a tactic, and uh, and and Shermer knows what he's doing. Like that's not <laughs> Michael Shermer knows what he's. Doing. Now that's not something that like you know the for that that's not something that quote unquote the establishment has done in any kind of top down you know in c- cigar smoke filled rooms you know decided to do you know decided to beat up on a bunch of uh, or highlight a bunch of people who were questioning the journal system. Because they because the journal system shits all over their stupid ideas, right? Kind of like the like the example of from from the Middle Ages of some merchant who's questioning the physics put forth by the cathedral monks in the monasteries. It's it's not it's not a top down plan to to associate any questioning of the journals with a bunch of cranks and kooks. It's just that that's how it turned out. That there are a bunch of cranks and kooks, and they question the journals because the journals rightfully say that they're full of shit, which then makes a problem for when you know you have a legitimate questioning of of narrative right especially when it comes to race and then there's an additional problem in that the racial narrative is something that's been deeply ingrained in a lot of people right it is it is the modern day form of sin right you got people and and it's and it's pretty extreme you know you got all sorts of democrats they're willing to work with you know George W Bush right and and war you know they they they're, they're willing to forgive George W Bush and all the hell and all the carnage that he caused in in the Middle East right to to brown people in the Middle East believe it or not you know and they're not look they they don't forgive that but that's nowhere near as worse as bad as what Trump's doing right which is racism Trump would 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 you know if Trump ultimately had his druthers perhaps he would deport you know 5 million people let's say you know and 5 million people get deported now that's rough you know, being made to go back to another country, 
start your life over again in another country. Well, not entirely over because you'll still have your resume of what you did in the States, but you kind of have to start. It's rough, okay? And you're in a poor country, right? There's, there's all sorts of, that, that's that's no fun, okay? But it's nothing like was done to Iraq. I mean, it's not even close, okay? You know, kill, I don't know how many people died as a result of the invasion. Well over a million people just straight up died. Many more were, were maimed in a permanent way, loss of limb or, or something, were seriously hurt for the rest of their lives. The standard of living of all the people, not only in Iraq, but also in Syria, I don't know how many people that is, you know, so, somewhere on the order of 30 million, had their lives destroyed totally, okay? So, so it's not, not even close. It doesn't even hold a candle. Right, being made to go back to Mexico, you know that sucks because it's Mexico because it's full of Mexican stuff. Mexico, um, so yeah, that's that's not not. But it's it it it's it doesn't even hold a candle to the carnage and destruction that George Bush did. Not not even it it shouldn't even be the subject of comparison. Okay, but but George Bush wasn't racist, and so it's it's less. It seems less bad. It seems less bad because George Bush wasn't a racist. See how that works. Um, so and and so Democrats are much are much warmer, are much co- cozier with George Bush than they are with with Trump. Or let me put it this way: you may say, well, they're they're cozier with George Bush because he's further in the past, and so th- those emotions are less raw. Okay, fair enough. Let's try try this. The Democrats they they were much cozier with Jeb Bush. And Ted Cruz and all like the war hawks, all, all the Republican fucking Dr. Strangelove guys who are saying, we need to show Russia that we're tough people. We need to show China that we mean business. You know, all those all those maniacs in the Republican primary saying even John Kasich. John Kasich suddenly becomes becomes a real fighter when it comes to, you know, sent, to sending the U.S. into war. You know, like <laughs> it's just just crazy. Um, anyway. But, but you know, and look, the Democrat Party obviously doesn't like those guys, you know, and doesn't like the fact that they're pro-war, but, but it, it, they're, they, and they, and they dislike them, but their hatred of Trump is pathological, utterly pathological, and it's because of quote-unquote racism, even though by any measurable, measurable standard, right, the amount of harm done by these wars is just like like going to be like at least a hundred times more than the harm caused by deportation it, it, and and so and so that there is is a very clear evidence of what i'm saying of of of, of racism quote unquote as a self referential sin but most people don't think this way you know cuz most people they think in terms of you know they they don't think it's like oh is this is this a, a objective harm based morality or whatever like most like people's moralities are not designed like this they're, they're they're not designed like humans sort of evolved to hold the values of the group and to and to not merely mimic or or pretend to have the values of the groups i mean sociopath but to internalize the values of the group themselves and funnily enough, I think this is why you end up with a lot of um, a, a lot of white nationalists not uh, get accused of being sociopaths because white nationalists don't hold the values of the groups of X Y Z group. Like for example, if 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 a key value of your group is quote unquote anti racism and belief in racial oppression in white racial oppression that must be overcome. And whites must work to over, to overcome their own status as oppressors, right? This is weird. It's just bizarre. I mean, what kind of what kind of a bizarre situation do you have where like everyone in the society agrees that white people are oppressors, including the white people, and white people are working hard to deconstruct their their oppressive nature, but it's just so hard to do. Like, I mean, that's crazy, right? I mean, you're getting into, into crazy town. And of course, and of course, the the the, the, le- the layers of complexity you have to have, and to, to to perpetuate this belief that white people who who believe that they are unjust oppressors and are trying to deconstruct their own oppression just can't do it because it's so deeply bound and so deeply intertwined in the basic fabric of society and and internalized in, in the psychology and, and this this internalized white supremacy in psychology is perpetuated over the generations right i mean 
you know, and, but let's say, you know, and, and so if you have all these beliefs um, and someone comes along and says, I don't have those beliefs. Now you have somebody who doesn't hold the beliefs of the group. Typically, the people who don't hold the beliefs of the group, you know, that their 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 values don't conform to the values of others. They those people are usually sociopaths. OK, so if you meet somebody who doesn't hold like the, 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 the values that most of your group has, right? And they're like in your country, for example, like they're, 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 they're mingling amongst you, but they don't, for example, believe in the racial oppression narrative, you know, and they don't believe that they owe other groups, you know, equal treatment, that they're, that they're not a universalist, for example, you know, um, it's, not, it's not a stupid thing to, to, to assume that this person is a sociopath. Now, there's a good chance that if they're not, that if it has to do with race, right, that they're not sociopaths, right? And the reason being is that the is that the racial narrative that people have is something very unnatural that came very recently, and it's something that is that is a product of construction and conditioning, right? And you have certain people who, for whatever reason, that construction and conditioning didn't work on. Okay. And they're not sociopaths. They just don't, <laughs> they're not like, like I'm not a sociopath. I just don't buy into your BS. And now this can create an additional problem because like, you know, when you're arguing against somebody, like when you have somebody who doesn't believe like in your fundamental beliefs, right? Like this, like this is fucking more important than, than Jesus at this point. For, right. You basically have somebody who a doesn't, share your fundamental beliefs and B views you as kind of a shitty person for being anti-white. So this person doesn't share your fundamental beliefs. That's a, that's, you know, Oh, that's, that's evil, right? That's now the average person doesn't think in terms of like the clinical term sociopath, but, but colloquially they'll think, Oh, this is an evil person. And he, and this person doesn't like you particularly because he, and he'll call you an anti-white bigot and, and a hater. And, and so this person doesn't like you personally, probably treats you poorly personally because you're anti-white. So, so this person is, so, so to somebody who's like, who's bought into the, the racial narrative and is interacting with, with, a, with a white nationalist, they're going to think this white nationalist is, is, a, is a sociopath, is, is a beast. And in addition to having beastly political views, is beastly on a personal level. But in reality, it's just, you know, it's just you have a religion he doesn't, right? Because white nationalism is not a doctrine. It's not. It's, it's not a, a, a quote unquote belief system. It's it's more primitive. Than, you know, if you want to think pejoratively, or we could say it's more natural than that, in in a more positive spin, right? Whatever term you want to use for it, it's not. It's not a constructed doctrine. It's not constructed. The 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 slavery, colonialism, segregation, white privilege, multi generational oppression. That is a constructed. Right. That that is a that is a. Uh, a child of doctors, you know, simple, my group, Ooga Booga, you know, that's not, that's not constructed by it. That's just natural or primitive. Okay. And that's also why it's not going to be something that's going to go right. Cause if you're, cause if you're arguing for, for example, like if you, ha there was like some other religion, you know, like some, I don't know, Zoroastrianism and Zoroastrianism got replaced by Islam. It's not like, you know, a hundred years later, you're still going to be having to deal with each generation, having to convince them and having to condition them and conditioning the kids each generation that Zoroastrianism is wrong because there's no natural inclination towards Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism was entirely a product of doctrine. It was entirely constructed. Whereas white nationalism is just, it's just wanting a white country and a white ethno state. That's not a product of construction. And so it's going to come back endlessly. You know, it's, it, it can never be defeated unless, well, it can never be defeated within whites. Now, it can be defeated in a country if you make whites a minority, but, and, and so it can be prevented from gaining political power in that way, but it can never be defeated in whites unless you just kill all whites. So, and, 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 and that's the tension. And that's what I think, um, a lot of people on quote unquote the alt left, you know, not the, not the rank and file Democrat voters, but the real extreme anti whites, the real extreme anti white thinkers, they're thinking in these terms. They're thinking of how do we end whiteness? 
and they and they start to say things that sound genocidal because look the ultimate evil to them is white identity right and white nationalism and 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 white nationalism is basically the natural default doctrine of white people okay and it's and it's bashed out of white people through conditioning but these people they know that or or they may not know that they may not want to put it in those terms because when you put it in those terms you know it doesn't look very good for what they're doing but they're sort of aware that this whole like white identity stuff it, it's something that's just not going away it just it just won't go away you know and like other political movements when you pour on this level of pressure on it you know they eventually die but this but this white nationalism stuff it's just not going away and and you know it, and when it happens for so long they, they start to sort of twist and pretzel into thinking that like this must just be something about white people something inextricable about white people now because these people are like all marxoid blank slaters or whatever they try to explain it in like you know, they, they try to explain it in, like you know, it's, it's, it's like circles within circles, right? You know, it's, it's sort of a, trying to explain the motion of the planets, Earth at the center. You have to, you know, it's ellipses within ellipses. It's these really complicated things. And so when you're trying to explain why white nationalism won't gonna go away, you know, without reference to some sort of innate biological bias towards that amongst amongst whites and amongst any people racially, um, you're going to constantly be you, your 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 explanations are just going to get so and so complicated because you, because you refuse to accept biology. But but even they are starting you know they'll they'll let it slip every once in a while. They'll say things like oh it's it's good that white people are dying or it's good that white people are you know that sh that guy Sean from Sean and Jen he said straight up yeah it's good that white people you know it would be good if white people were being you know replaced right. Because I think what they're starting to realize is that's the only way. That's the only way to truly eliminate the the sin, quote unquote, racism. Right? And racism, as we all know, it just means it just means. So <laughs> it's a little shell game. The term racism. And of course, I could do a whole another one of these just on the term racism and what kind of a mind fuck that that word and just how dishonest that that that's another that that'll be uh something for the next long video sunday so yeah so a bit of a ranty long video sunday uh the truth is i was not feeling up to doing this long video sunday i didn't really have a whole lot i wanted to talk to i just start to talk about i just started on the cargo cult stuff and just sort of went off from there so if it's kind of rambly and it seems like I didn't come in here with a purpose or really anything specific to say, well, <laughs> it's that's because I came in here without much of a purpose and with much to say. Just uh, doing the long video Sunday because, you know, yeah, I, look, some people like to listen to me babble on about this stuff playing in the background while games. I know how this works. Like I, I'll listen to Fash the Nation in the background while I'm playing some video game or whatever. So. You know, I, I know what people do with these things. So, you know, if this, if this is just background music for you while you're doing other things and sort of decompressing out after a day of work, that's fine. Whatever you use this for. So, but that's, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say here. That'll be the end of this long video Sunday. As usual, I have no idea how to conclude these things. So I'll just uh, go ahead and conclude it.